Okay, and sir, give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. A 22-year-old and his mother gunned down. They were two members of a wealthy, well-known family allegedly linked to other tragic death investigations in South Carolina. More than a month later, still no arrests have been made in this murder mystery. We now have audio from the heartbreaking 911 call. We'll play it for you next. Good evening. I'm Adrian Bankert. And for Ashley, more than a month after cold-blooded homicide in South Carolina, police have released the 911 call placed by the victim's husband and father moments after he found the two bodies. On the night of June 7th, prominent Low County attorney Alex Murdaugh discovered his 52-year-old wife Maggie and his 22-year-old son Paul shot dead at their Colleton County hunting estate. Now, this is the beginning of that call when Murdaugh, at times overcome with grief, begs dispatchers to send first responders to help. Let's listen. Collison, I have an Alex Murdoch on the line, caller from 4147 Moselle Road. He's advising that his wife and child was shot. Okay, and sir, give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. Okay. And did you see anyone? Okay. Is he breathing at all? No. No. Is she? Okay. Do you see anything? Do you see anyone in the area? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Now, that call lasted more than seven minutes, telling uh, the dispatcher he had not been home, that no one else was supposed to be at the house that night. Nothing seemed out of place. We're going to listen to more of that 911 call and discuss what, if anything, we can learn from it. We're joined tonight by forensic analyst and distinguished scholar of applied forensics at Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan, also by retired NYPD lieutenant and criminal justice expert Darren Porcher and News Nation's anchor Rudabay Shabazi. Thank you all for being with us. And Ruta Bay, uh, we start with you. Now, the reason these murders are getting so much attention is because one of the victims, Paul Murdaugh, was awaiting trial in connection to a fatal boating crash, right? That's right. He is the son who was found dead. And in February of 2019, a 19-year-old woman named Mallory Beach was thrown from a boat that Paul Murdoch was allegedly piloting drunk. Her body was discovered a week later, and Paul is facing three felony charges, or was at the time of his death. Now, state officials are reviewing whether law enforcement agencies actually tried to obstruct this investigation. We know this is a powerful and well-connected legal family. And at the time of the boating accident, nurses said Alex Murdoch and his father, who's a former prosecutor, came to the emergency room. They tried to talk to everyone on the boat, according to those nurses. And two nurses said that Alex Murdoch was looking closely at the, a board that staff uses to track patients. And one nurse even told him to stay in his son's room or leave the hospital. And security guards were also told to watch him. Investigators didn't find out that it was Paul Murdoch driving the boat until weeks later. Wow. And again, we've seen this beautiful young lady uh, thrown from the boat in that accident. Uh, this could be part of the investigation as we look at the broader case here and, of course, this, this double homicide. I'm going to start with you, Darren. What is the first thing that police are looking for when they arrive at a scene like this, especially knowing that it took them some time to get to the property, the families, uh, the family members, rather, who were murdered were found on the hunting property, just a, a ways away from the house. Would it have been clear that this was a targeted killing? The first thing we're going to do as law enforcement is we're going to conduct something we refer to as a backwards investigation. We have the body in the state that we received it as police. Then we're going to look to see who was the last person that saw both of these individuals. This appears to be a rural property. So what more than likely the police would do in a situation like this is dump the cell phone tower. In dumping the cell phone tower, meaning extracting the communications in connection with cell phone um, calls, 
on that particular property. It should be it shouldn't be a whole lot here. So it shouldn't be difficult for police to assess who made calls and for what duration and time. That information is going to be captured and it's going to be folded into the investigation. We also want to take in consideration, as you mentioned earlier, the son was a possible potential suspect in a homicide investigation, or I should say a death investigation, in connection with the boating accident. So we're going to triangulate that information from uh, the boat, the, coupled with the, um, the cell phone tower, and with that backwards investigation, and that's going to give us a level of traffic. Action. I believe that the police should have a level of leads up to this point because we only had a few people there so we can discount a lot of additional entities that would be conversion on the scene. I want to get to you, Joseph, and talk to you from a forensic standpoint what investigators will be looking for, but let's listen to another portion of that 911 recording first. Okay. I don't want you to touch them at all, okay? I don't, I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't, I don't want you to touch them just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? I, I already touched them, trying to get a, um, to see if they were breathing. Okay. Well, I, I just don't want you to move anything, just in case they can get any kind of evidence. Okay. Ma'am, I'm gonna call. I, I need to call some of my family. Okay. Well, well, do me a favor for me. Whenever you see the officer or the medics, because they're, they're all coming to you. Absolutely. Okay. But we have them come in. Turn on the flashes on your vehicle so they can see you, okay? You got the flashes on for me? I do. And again, these bodies were found quite a ways away from the home uh, on the hunting lodge near the kennels of that family's hunting estate. Uh, Joe, can you just tell us about whether or not the bodies should have been touched to be checked for a pulse? I mean, obviously, the dispatcher wants to preserve any evidence there. This was the right thing to do, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. You want to first assess assess these individuals and see if there's still any sign of life whatsoever. And, and the dad would have done that, uh, you know, the husband, the, the father, he would have done that. And I, I don't, as a, as a death investigator by trade, I, I don't have a problem with that. But once that is assessed and you've determined that there is no more hope, uh, the body should be backed off uh, from at that point. Because, you know, to be quite blunt with you, the bodies are essentially the biggest piece of evidence that you have in a case like this, particularly a case involving a double homicide. So you want to leave them as pristine as you possibly can so that you can't disrupt them in any way because it's all about context in this particular case. Right, and Ruta Bay, I wanna bring you in again. Obviously, we've seen a lot of these killings covering headlines like these, but there was so much beyond just this death. There were suspicions that these were revenge killings, right? Yeah, we talked about that other death investigation, the boating investigation just a minute ago, and there's also been speculation that Maggie and Paul's murders were somehow connected to another case, that they uh, were apparently receiving online threats before that happened. Uh, and also in 2015, Stephen Smith, he was a 19-year-old found dead on a roadway, and originally uh, investigators tagged this as a hit and run, but Murdoch's name came up again and again repeatedly in the Highway Patrol's years-long investigation. One person even told detectives that Buster Murdoch, he's the other brother, killed him because of his sexual orientation. And now in light of this double murder, investigators are taking another look at that case. And that's not the only thing, Adrian. Alex Murdoch, the father, settled a wrongful death claim in 2018. 57-year-old uh, housekeeper, the fa her family members sued the family after she allegedly tripped and fell and died and his insurance provider ended up paying more than half a million dollars. It's no uh, no mention in those documents where she fell or why they were at fault in her death. It's just a sad story on so many levels. Darren, is there a surprise that we haven't seen any arrest yet at all? 
No, I'm not surprised. It appears as if the family is well connected in that particular area. And so, um, as my counterpart just mentioned, there's been a trilogy of different incidents that would lend credence to the, um, the son being a suspect in these prior cases. I think that this is one of these things that will gain traction and will eventually gain an arrest in this because we clearly see that this was a targeted homicide. We had a son and the mother that were, uh, that were killed as it a, as a relates to being at that particular property. So I just think it's a matter of time before a suspect is taken into custody. I think the challenge is the family is just so well connected and it appears as if there was a series of barriers that were, pre that were preventing the son from being charged in the prior acts. Yeah, many reports saying that basically everybody in town knew who they were. Um, Joseph, we know that a black SUV owned by the law firm where Murdoch was a partner was removed from this crime scene from the home. Considering all that we know, considering what we don't know, what would be a potential reason for investigators taking that vehicle? Oh, well, let me tell you, you know, we have the Suburban that is taken into custody. It's a 2021. And then there is an older model, Yukon, that was there, but it was left. It was not removed. So obviously the police have some suspicion as to this vehicle potentially being involved. Now, one thing I take real exception to in this case, and this is kind of woven throughout the story uh, that was written in some of the local papers, is that the police directed a record driver to simply put on rubber rubber gloves, get in this vehicle, and drive the vehicle to be hooked up and taken in. This is completely out of line. Uh, a police officer dressed in a Tyvek suit, which you see us out on scenes wearing, you know, this, this white garment that protects us from leaving any kind of biological samples from ourselves. Uh, we wear that with hair nets and gloves and shoe covers. That's not what has happened in this case. So if you're talking about contaminating scenes, that's one of the biggest problems that I see right there, uh, that you would handle this case this way. You would want to make sure that the chain of evidence is intact, that it is pristine, and that you don't have some record driver, which I'm sure he's a fine fellow, but you don't, he has no experience in crime scene investigation. What has he left behind in the vehicle? Remember, this evidence is very, very fragile. So you don't want anybody in this environment that doesn't know what they are doing. I hope they haven't shot themselves in the foot from Jump Street with this case. And Darren, I'll get, let you have the final word. I mean, obviously you're a former lieutenant with the NYPD. This is in South Carolina, a smaller town, a very tight knit community. Anything that you can say to us to kind of give us an idea of some of the other challenges in this case? The State Investigations Bureau should have taken control of this investigation immediately. It shouldn't have been handled on a local level because the local, inf the, the local police have a very limited source of resources. However, the state is who traditionally handles cases of this magnitude, and I felt that they should have stepped in much sooner than they did. And so as a result, as my counterpart, um, Joseph Stott Morgan, mentioned, the crime scene could have possibly, or I believe it was contaminated, and it makes it more challenging in conducting a crime scene investigation or of a homicide of this magnitude moving forward. Well, it is certainly a case that a lot of people are paying attention to. I know this is not our final conversation. Thank you so much, Darren Joseph Rudebe. You were great with us tonight. We really appreciate your perspective. Stay with us. Up next, we're going to be taking you behind the shield. See what it's like to be on the front line of policing in America when we're joined by a couple of stars from Live PD. Welcome back to Banfield. In our regular installment of Policing in America, we're joined tonight by Live PD's Deputy James Craigmile and Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb. And still with us is retired NYPD Lieutenant Darren Porcher. Darren, I'm going to call you Dr. Porcher for this segment. I was just informed. And um, I'm also going to let you keep a title because all you all good. are very distinguished and have had a lot of service. So first, thank you for your service. But we want to take you first to Mississippi, where an arrest caught on cell phone by a bystander has many up in arms for the amount of force used by police. But really, it's a lesson in perspective as police have now released some body cam footage, which adds plenty of other pieces to the puzzle. 33-year-old Jasper Copeland was the passenger in a car. It was pulled over. Copeland has warrants out for his arrest, and according to police, he attempted to discard a bag believed to be drugs. Now, first, I want to show you the cell phone cam shot from across the street. Hey, cool. 
Dang. I hope they don't do nothing to him, man. They might say they got the chains and shoot him. Look at him, he they punching, punching him. <gasps> okay, that does not look good at all. We see the police throwing repeated punches. We see no evidence of the suspect fighting back. And many who have seen this video are demanding not only answers, but justice. But now let's take a look at the police body cam, which shows a bit more. Jasper, come on out here, okay? Just put your hands on top of the car when you do. I will pat you down, make sure you ain't got nothing gonna poke me, stick me, cut me, shoot me, or anything like that. I'm gonna empty everything in your pockets right here in this seat, okay? All right. Stay right here against the vehicle. You understand me? Yes, Officer Gasway's got a taser. If you try, try and do anything like that, we're gonna pop you, okay? Bring your hands back here behind your back. Bring them back here behind your back. Hey, go, we got. I ain't got no cover, man. Get on the ground, Jasper. Get on the ground now. Right now. Okay. All right, Sheriff Lamb, I'm going to have you start here. Uh, what's going on? Well, this is a perfect example of why video doesn't always tell the full story. You know, the first video you showed, yeah, it does show, you know, looks kind of bad. But then when you see this, you see clearly that he was resisting. He attempted to flee from him. And at that point, we don't know what's going on. We don't know whether he has weapons. We don't know any of that. And we have to do what we have to do to subdue that subject so that we can take him into custody uh, and protect our own lives and the civilians' lives around there as well. Uh, you can armchair quarterback every single call we go on, and you can see clearly that video doesn't always make it clear and decisive. We try to do the best we can, and I think these guys did the best they could. They had to, they had to uh, strike them a few times, and they got them to the ground and neutralized the situation. Deputy Craig Mile, I mean, a lot of people, even in seeing the body camera footage, would say it's still not justifying throwing blows, you know, striking uh, a, a, an alleged suspect with punches. But what is the proper way to do this? Yeah, you know, the proper way is through techniques. And a lot of times in the heat of the moment, techniques don't always work because sometimes you have a suspect that's going for your gun or a knife, or maybe they have a gun or a knife. And you also have to take the physical stature of the suspect that you're taking into custody and maybe the training that they have. Uh, we don't know the level of training that they have. And clearly in this video, you can see that the suspect is resisting, just like Sheriff Lamb said. And what they are attempting to do to this suspect, because whenever a suspect or, or anybody is in that situation, they're getting really hot, they're getting sweaty. So whenever you're trying to go hands on and you're trying to grab somebody either in a, in a, on an arm bar or you're just trying to do a soft, empty hold on this person, they're slipping out because their skin is so slick. So at that point, a lot of the techniques go out the window. And like Sheriff Lamb said, we've got to be able to get this person in custody to protect ourselves and the citizens around there and to protect himself. We don't know if he's just taken a whole bunch of drugs and what if he gets away and runs around a corner uh, and ends up dying there or ends up going into some type of a, a medical coma or needs some, need some assistance. So we got to give him into custody. And if that means some blows, then unfortunately, the suspect dictated the outcome in this situation. Dr. Porcher, do you have anything that you would add? Yes, um, I was a former instructor in the NYPD Police Academy, and also I was a lieutenant in the NYPD's Internal Affairs Bureau. So in many instances, cases of this magnitude came into my purview. The one thing that I see that's germane in this is the suspect is holding both fists clenched at eye level. That being said, the officer taking two blows, I felt was an appropriate level of force because the suspect is still standing upright with his fists with his fist clenched. Therefore, eventually, when the suspect eventually goes to the ground, it didn't appear as if the officers were attempting to assault him, but they were attempting to restrain him. And so, as the sheriff mentioned earlier, the video shows you different aspects of it. It's multifaceted when you conduct these types of investigations. So, as a result, I feel that the use of force was appropriate in this case. All right, gentlemen, thank you for your perspectives. We're going to go on to another incident, Bayonne, New Jersey, where a fatal police shooting is raising a lot of questions regarding dealing with the mentally ill, which is never easy uh, for anyone, families, law enforcement. Tragically, an emotionally disturbed man's own mother 
was the one who called police for help in dealing with her son. Take a look. It's, it's hard to watch, and it's even harder to watch and listen to if you have a family member who has struggled with mental illness and if you've had to be in this situation, which a lot of people in a lot of families have had to deal with. So I'm going to start with you, um, Deputy Craig Mile. What has law enforcement had to do differently, especially as we seem to, seem, oh, seem to see rather a rise in cases where mental health is an issue? Yeah, I've been on these exact calls before where you have somebody that uh, has some type of mental issues going on, whether it's drug induced or um, just a, a normal medical issue. And you have to weigh your options. Um, the officers were called there by this individual's mother because the individual was um, not acting normal and possibly was threatening to harm her. So the officers pushed into the house and, and they're stuck there at the staircase. They can't retreat at this point because as we use in terminology in law enforcement, now we own up to the staircase. And if we retreat out, now he has more of a potential to go get other weapons. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you heard the officers there, they begged this guy uh, to put the knife down. And this was a classic unfortunate suicide by cop uh, is what it seemed like here. And the officers at this point have an obligation to protect this individual, uh, the mother, and also to protect the guy with the knife. And um, it, it's just an unfortunate situation, but we go through training. We have uh, different training um, simulators that we go through, and we actually do repetitions with situations like this. Sheriff Lamb, I know we only have a few more seconds here, but. Uh some people at home might be wondering why, if you know that they're mentally ill, if you know they're disturbed, wouldn't there be other tactics used, tasers or other types of ways to subdue them rather than lethal force? You know, there's always other tactics, but we don't dictate what happens there. A lot of this is dictated by the people that we're dealing with. You know, we got, like James said, they were called there. They had to deal with the situation. There's a 21-foot rule, which means that if somebody's within 21 feet, you don't even have time to draw your weapon in time. I run th citizens through these types of scenarios all the time, and they all fail them. Um, we have split. We have to make split-second decisions, and in the end, we have to protect the mother. We have to protect, protect ourselves, because I'm not going to tell a deputy's wife if he gets hurt well the other person had mental health issues that's why we didn't act we have to act to protect ourselves and others thank you all gentlemen we will have more right after this break stay with us Welcome back to Banfield. Still with me as we go inside policing in America. Live PD's Deputy James Craig Mile, Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb, also with us, retired NYPD Lieutenant Darren Porcher. And I want to get to as many as these of these as we can. So let's first go to the NYPD, where an officer brings new meaning to working with what he's got. Arriving on the scene in Harlem to a stabbing victim, Officer Ronald Kelly didn't have time to wait for the paramedics. I want you to look at this, but we warn viewers some might find this disturbing. <laughs> Right now. Let me see. Let me see. Call me I know, I know. Just, just relax. Go in there and give me tape. 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 Knife. 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 We got you. We got you. Don't touch. Don't touch. Don't touch. Don't touch. We got you. We got you. I mean, it's graphic video, but it's really amazing. Uh, Dr. Porcher, I've got to go to you first, former NYPD lieutenant. I mean, this, have you heard of somebody using a potato chip bag to save somebody? 
I've heard of people using a variation of different things. Just to speak to this particular incident in question, the officer was a former EMT, mm. so he had an understanding of how to apply a bandage in a situation like this. And the precinct is only, I want to say, four blocks away. I actually worked in that command wow. for a period of time. So it's just so unfortunate crime runs prevalent on that corner. In addition to that, the officers actually captured the person, I want to say maybe an hour later, wow. and, and took that person into custody. But this is a clear and classic example of heroism from that officer by saving this stabbing victim's life. Yeah, he was like uh, MacGyver. He just made it happen and then had somebody who was a bystander there or somebody who was a witness to the crime run in and get the stuff he needed, the tape and et cetera. But let's go to Tampa now, a case that's almost out of the Wild West, showing you just how quickly an officer must react and show how a fraction of a second could be the difference between life and death. Officer Brian Velasquez of the Tampa Police Department responds to a call of an argument at a convenience store. But I want to show you how that argument escalated to the end of someone's life and again, Another warning, this may be disturbing video. Right outside, he has a gun. He picked up here. He's just here, standing here. He's right here. He has two beers in the hand. 10 0. We're going to be meeting him. Hey, put the gun down! Put it down! Put it down! I got an arm shot. He's running. He's armed. Put the gun down! You're gonna get shot! Put the gun down now! Put the gun down now! Put it down, man! Put it down! I'm right here! Put the gun down! Put it down! Put it down! Put it down. Yeah, we had to cut it there. Um, I. I, I... Sheriff Lamb, I mean, I know, this is a difficult piece of video to watch, and it happens time and time again. What is the now rule when pursuing a suspect like this? I guess there was an altercation inside that convenience store, which led the officer to pursue this man who had a weapon in his hand. Yeah, you know, he, he responded to a call. He was called there for a crime, a potential crime. Uh, and that one, he started to kind of go after the guy. He saw the guy had a gun. At that point, that officer did a great job because he's got a duty to, to protect the other people in that community. You don't know who he's going to run into once he's running down that street. Uh, the officer did a great job of giving commands. He gave him every opportunity. And it wasn't until the very end where the guy actually took a couple steps towards him, raised the gun in a threatening manner. And I thought this officer did an outstanding job. He, he did his job. And, uh, you know, it's tough for him. He's got to now live with this, but uh, he goes home to his family and he was able to protect the community while he was at it. I think it was an outstanding job. You hate to see somebody lose their life, and I, I'm sorry to say it like that, but it, this officer made some good decisions and did everything that I could see. Uh, he did a good job. You see the video, we just showed it very quickly there, of officers uh, trying to save the life of that suspect um, who had just been shot by an officer. Uh, Deputy Craig Mile, a lot of people ask questions about the tactics used. You know, why aren't they shot in the leg? And why aren't they shot with rubber bullets or with, uh, again, being tased instead of using lethal force? What is the answer? You know, I, I've had that question asked to me before, and it's, uh, I ask him, put yourself in our shoes. You chase that suspect in the middle of the night down a dark street or lighted street or the middle of the day, knowing that suspect has a gun in their hand, and are you gonna chase them with a rubber bullet? Are you gonna chase them and, and attempt to shoot them as you're jumping over curbs or hitting a pothole or you're getting on the radio or you're giving commands? It's extremely difficult to hit a moving target in a leg when somebody's running or zigging or zagging. And there comes a point in time to where we're going to have to stop making the police out to be the bad guy and hold the suspects accountable. I mean, the suspect, this was his actions. He dictated what happened. He could have easily have gave up. He could have easily have said, hey, you know what? I was in the wrong. I've got a gun. Uh, but instead, he chose to take off running because he didn't want to go to jail. Yeah. Well, let's end on a brighter note. How about that? Down in jo Jonesboro, Arkansas, an officer actually pulled over a driver for a failure to signal. And uh, word to the wise, if you have warrants out for your arrest, you may not want to signal when you change lanes. Actually, I know we have a happier story after this one, but let's, let's talk about the driver winding up being arrested. The kicker where uh, he was going when he got pulled over was that he was delivering Chinese food as a DoorDash driver. So the officer did this. 
Is there a Sherry here? Can I talk to her? Her DoorDash guy got arrested. I brought her her food. Oh. You're Sherry? Yes, sir. All right, your DoorDash guy got arrested, so I brought your food to you. All right, thank you. <laughs> That's an interesting, that's going beyond the call of duty. I'll just say that. Um, thank you to that officer who delivered the DoorDash meal. You don't usually see that kind of video um, from a body cam or a dash cam video. So, gentlemen, thank you again for your time. Retired NYPD Lieutenant Darren Porcher, Live PD's Deputy James Craig Mile, and Sheriff Mark Lamb, who can also now be seen on American Sheriff Network. So congratulations on that. Thank you again, gentlemen. Have thank a great you. weekend. Thank you. Now, coming up on a Friday, we could all use more laughs, right? Let's get in a good mood. What's exactly, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take a lighter side of the week's news when we come back. Okay, it's Friday. Let's just all take a big, deep breath and start the weekend off with a little relaxation and a look at the lighter side of the news. We're doing it tonight with friends of the show, comedians Ben Glebe, and you're going to see him soon in the live virtual show, Glebe Off the Top, and Pete Dominic, host of the podcast, Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Gentlemen, welcome. Let's get right to it, okay? Oh, sounds like a plan. All right. I like the salute. This is very official. Okay. <laughs> Well, the upcoming Tokyo Olympic Games has its share of obstacles not limited to attempting to control the spread of COVID in the Olympic Village. Um, the problem is the Olympic athletes are known to, you know, celebrate in their rooms in the village once their events are done. Um, so there's cardboard bed frames the Tokyo Olympic Games are providing the athletes. Cardboard, allegedly built to crumble under the weight of more than one person. Here's Stephen Colbert's take. So let's see this anti-sex bed. Wow. Every expense was spared. <laughs> Looks like they built an IKEA wardrobe, then made a bed out of the box it came in. <laughs> so far, athletes do not seem deterred from getting it on. As American track star Paul Chalimo noted, while the beds have a weight restriction of 440 pounds, I see no problem for distance runners. <laughs> Even four of us can do. Four. Four. Uh, the Tokyo Olympics deny the beds were designed to dissuade sex and that they were designed that way because they're 100% recyclable. Gentlemen, I don't know that anybody's going to be getting any action because you can't take any loved ones, you can't take your family, you can't take anybody with you. You're going solo to the games, correct? <laughs> Not correct because athletes are very... Uh, well suited for picking up on other athletes. They've just won gold medals or lost. Either way, they're drunk and they're drinking their sorrows away or they're ready to get down. I love how, how ready to get down this athlete that was quoted was saying, even four of us can do. He's using yeah. an abbreviation for sex. They even say do it. We can just do. I mean, all they're trying to stop with 440 pound weight limit is five sums. And I think that's a very generous Whoa. line to draw, really. Whoa, I didn't expect to hear that on the show today. Five I, sums. Pete. Just saying. I, I, just saying. I, I don't understand this story and why it's getting so much attention. These are the most elite athletes in the world. They can bend into any position right. they want. They can, they can hold positions for minutes at a time. They don't need a bed to have any kind of physical relation. And by the way, none of us do. Right, Pete, right. Breaking news, we can use the floor. Yeah, and also, right. you're not going to win. You're not going to win. If you're there and you're in the prime of your physical condition, everybody that is there, they should have stories. They're all in the best shape yeah. of their life. They should all be having sex with each other. The okay. Olympic... O stands for orgy. Okay, okay. On that happy note, before I start blushing, let's go on to the next story. How about that? Uh, Tom Brady and the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers visited President Biden at the White House this week, and the Super Bowl MVP seemed to throw some shade at MAGA Nation, but you beat the judge. It didn't look great there. At one point, we were 7-5, and five, struggling a little bit, um, as the president alluded to. Um, but we found our rhythm. We got on a roll. Not a lot of people... Uh, you know, think that we could have won. And um, in fact, I think about 40% of the people still don't think we won. I understand that. You understand that, Mr. President? I understand that. Yeah. 
See, I think, yeah, okay. I'm going to let you guys talk this one out. <laughs> well, let me, let me just first say that a lot of, first of all, when even Trump supporter historically, Tom Brady, is mocking you for believing the big stupid lie, which is what it should be referred to now, and that's just the big lie, the big stupid lie at this point, that he won the election, it is way past time for you to hang up your broken sense of logic and get on board the sane train. I am not trying to be biased here. I'll be as unbiased as I can, but MAGA people are so delusional and unable to understand anything they see or hear that they literally saw that clip and thought he was making fun of Biden. I mean, at this point, you have zero understanding of anything. I don't even know how they figured out how to vote. It's truly incredible. Well, listen, first of all, I resent Ben dressing up so nicely on a Friday night, lighthearted note. I want to just say, I want to take a shot at Ben's tie, first of all. Come on. Second of all, <laughs> second of all, I want to start a feud. Second of all, listen, the, Tom Brady and Donald Trump have something in common, for real. They both will win at any cost, and they will both cheat to win, and they will both dump someone oh, when no. they are a loser. Oh, so no. Tom Brady keeps winning. Donald Trump lost. He's off the Brady train. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change gears here. We got to go to the next topic because y'all are just throwing all kinds of extra shade on the shade that was thrown by Tom Brady. Jeff Bezos became the second billionaire in two weeks to launch himself into space. Watch. Five, four, command engine start. Two, one. And New Shepard has cleared the tower on our way to space with our first What Duke might crew. be more interesting than another billionaire in space could be that the richest man in the world's comments at his press conference following the launch, Bezos addressing supporters and Amazon employees said that it drew laughter from the crowd. Maybe the richest man in the world could have just selected or, you know, picked up the bill. Um, Bezos stepping down as CEO of Amazon earlier this month, but still remains its largest shareholder. I think everybody, honestly, there's been so much debate over why they didn't use their money to, you know, help support causes on this planet versus going up in space, but it's their money. They can spend it the way they want, right? Well, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be their money. It should be our money. They should all be taxed like crazy. And I, I mean, listen, I read a lot of outcomes of the story. A lot of things have come out. First of all, the, apparently they're not astronauts, Branson or Bezos, because they didn't go up high, high enough and they didn't fly their own rockets themselves. They were operated from uh, the ground. But the, the, the greatest story is that the Danish teenager that Bezos brought with him on his phallic rocket told him while they were firing up into the upper sky that he's never even bought Amazon. But also we can all complain, you guys, about Amazon but the truth is most of us are guilty I mean my daughters buy like like a, a bracelet from China with a giant box covered in plastic we're all to blame for this so it's easy to take a shot at Bezos but as long as we're supporting Amazon then I think we should probably be pointing the finger back at ourselves that's fair that's fair but at the same time it doesn't mean that when somebody makes money off of us they're not beholden to maybe do something a little bit more noble with it and it's just Going into outer space just long enough for it to be a fun ride, but not to do anything meaningful up there or no experiments, that is peak billionaire. And that mindset needs to change. And I have news for these two guys, Bezos and Branson. Going into barely outer space isn't even cool. I mean, all this money spent and they barely tickle space. I think to really let them have it the rest of their lives, when they mention they went to outer space, we should all just reply, did you? Oh, my <laughs> really? goodness. Oh, no. I've, we have more to talk about. Ben and Peter are going to stick around for us more after the break. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> Back now for the lighter side of the news with comedians Ben Glebe and Pete Dominic. Okay, to Yuba City, California. Shout out to NorCal. I didn't grow up too far from here, um, though this is not exactly what I'd want to make them famous for. There's really no introduction for this one other than asking you to imagine if you were out for a drive like these folks and witness this. I hope they wash my truck tomorrow. I just came. There's two more things I need to put on that list. I'm glad you said 
said something. Oh my God. Believe it or not, nobody was hurt. Oh my gosh. Once you get over the miracle that nobody died or was hurt, you have to ask yourself how in the world this happened. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's exactly what I was wondering <laughs> is. First of all, whoever's driving that car needs to work on their time management and just not rush so much. Take your time a little more. But oh that car God. flipped. That car flipped a bunch of times when it landed and nobody was hurt. Science needs to study these anomalies. I recently <laughs> messed up my shoulder for four months because I threw my dog a tennis ball too hard. <laughs> How is yeah, it possible? Yeah, well, clearly oh. Ben has some rotator cuff uh, PT to work out, and I am concerned about my old friend there. But listen, I... I I'm here for the small talk before the car launches through the sky. <laughs> right. I mean, the guy, the guy is talking. I hope they wash my car tomorrow. And I, I, I'll watch those videos all day long. That. Also, that car goes right between oh two power lines. And finally, my my most important weird <laughs> takeaway is who's filming their car rides? Is this something we should be doing? <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. One thing's going through my mind. Take a look at this. It, this this is perfect. Audrey, when they close the road, they put up big signs like this one. Ah! Very similar. Maybe they were reenactors. Who knows? <laughs> and they made it too. So you know what? I, I, I retract my previous statement. I am happy to know the folks of Yuba City know how to stop look and watch and then run to the first aid of that family, yeah. whoever that is in the middle of the road. So whew, nobody got hurt. Okay, listen to this. Disney has unveiled the Joe Biden animatronic for its Hall of Presidents. Have you guys seen this? Have you guys yeah. visited yeah. Disney and seen this? I love this. Take a look. It will feature some personalized touches for the 46th president, like a pair of aviator sunglasses on the mm -hmm. desk nest next to him. But not all are fans of the depiction. Here's Seth Meyers' take. You have Seth Myers. Look at that. Joe Biden was basically made to be in the Hall of Presidents. You can't tell the difference between the real Biden and the animatronic Biden. In fact, given how much of a wild card human Biden can be, I'm betting his aides would love to have the animatronic on standby for town halls. Oh, God. Oh, he's telling the corn pop story again. Bring in the robot. Oh, phew, Dodge. Oh, now the robot's telling the corn pop story. Oh, wait. But the, okay, I can actually follow it. I can follow it when the robot does it. Okay, Pete, Ben, you guys have 10 seconds to respond to that. Well, I, I just don't, I love Disney. I did my college internship there, but it looks like the, the robot's parents are Bill Maher and Kirk Douglas. It doesn't look anything like Joe Biden. I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get that either. And also, I don't think it even is a good representation of him because I heard that the robot Biden actually is in favor of common sense filibuster reform, whereas right. Biden right. doesn't right. want his okay. agenda passed at all. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you so much, Ben, Pete. Thank you to the audience. We'll be back with more Ashley Banfield. Ashley's back soon, but until then, enjoy. Enjoy your weekend.